This is a message from the ministry of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. For more information about our church, please visit calvarysb.com. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Since the last Sunday of October, that's the last time I stood before you to preach, it's been busy. Uh, I've been to Europe a couple times for ministry, uh, taught several conferences, did a block class at a Bible college, worked on Bible commentary. It's exciting to be able to say that my commentary on the book of Acts is now translated into Arabic, and uh, hopefully, yes, praise the Lord. And uh, hopefully by the end of this month, it'll be up on the website. And uh, Ingalil and I took holiday over the holidays in Sweden and in England with family. That was a very precious time. And we also got to visit a couple of our missionaries that we support here in our church, both from Sweden and Marshall and Debbie Allnut there in London. I was preaching at their church this last Sunday, and it was a great time. The most significant event for us personally in the last week was last Monday, was Inga Lil and I's 35th wedding anniversary. Stand up, sweetie. The true. So 35 years, and it was a special anniversary. But um, we're very blessed by all the work that God's doing, and I'm very blessed by just the support and uh, partnership that this wonderful congregation and Pastor Tommy has in the work that I'm doing. I'm just ask for your continued prayers. This Thursday I get on a plane all over again to go to Germany for a conference and to speak at a church and then to do a pastor's conference for Western European pastors. And so we just always need your prayer and your encouragement. Thank you for being so generous with it. But really the best thing that I have to give you this morning is I think something from God's word. And it's a message that I'm going to entitle God's mercy in the midst of disaster. So if you would open up your Bibles to Lamentations chapter 3. Don't be embarrassed if you need your table of contents to find the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is a shorter book of the Bible sandwiched right in between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And again, if you need to use the table of contents in the beginning of your Bible, that's fine. You may not have read the book of Lamentations very much. I must confess that I've never taught verse by verse through the book of Lamentations. But chapter 3, I think, speaks to us and to our present moment in a very powerful way. Lamentations is written in an acrostic format. In other words, it follows in its poetry the A, B, C, D of the Hebrew alphabet. And sort of one of the things that it communicates to us is that it's trying to give us almost a dictionary of the grief of human suffering. Lamentations was written by the prophet Jeremiah and written on the occasion of the destruction of Jerusalem. When we take a look at the devastation that's hit our own community, and it is devastation. We've all seen it on the television. Some of us have seen it with our own eyes. It is devastation. But that kind of thing that was devastation in a few areas of Montecito, it was spread out over an entire capital city in the days of Jeremiah with Jerusalem. And he shares in such a personal and powerful way, giving eloquent expression both to the grief of the human heart and the hope that God has in the midst of it. But first, let's take a look at the grief. Lamentations chapter 3, beginning here at verse 1. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer 
He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. In chapters 1 and 2 of Lamentations, Jeremiah wrote, speaking of the city of Jerusalem as a whole personified. Now, in chapter 3, he takes the place of one individual sufferer and pours out his heart. Before it was in the general, now it's in the specific. And brothers and sisters, I find something right there for us to take notice of, to notice that this kind of suffering, this kind of grief, it's personal. You know, we talk about our community being stunned, and it is. But there are personal stories of grief, personal stories of stress, personal stories of displacement and fear and nightmares that come back to us again and again and again. It may come, this suffering that Jeremiah speaks of, it may come to a nation or a community, but it always impacts individual lives. Those who have suffered, those who have been displaced, you're not just a a statistic. You're not just a number. You're not just a name on a news report. You're a person before God whom God cares for very deeply. At the same time, we recognize the attitude of heart that Jeremiah speaks of in verse 3. Did you see that line? You're almost surprised that it's in the Bible, aren't you? Surely he has turned his hand against me. That's a dark and desperate place. Look, it's one thing to feel like I had a bad day, the brakes aren't going my way, but when you feel that God himself isn't on your side, it it causes a lot of fear and apprehension. Now listen, I'm grateful for two things. I'm grateful that Jeremiah did not stay in this place. And hang on. We're going to get to a more hopeful section of this. But I'm also grateful that he gave expression to it. Sometimes we as Christians, we play a little bit too much let's pretend. And when somebody's burdened with grief, when somebody's impacted by catastrophe, our attitude is, well, come on, aren't you over it now? I'm happy that God gives vent to this kind of agony, to this kind of pain. Now there's the the, the shining light of hope that we're going to see later on. But we don't condemn the person who feels the agony. Now I must say, and this is a very important point, please don't miss this, that there's a great contrast between the events that Jeremiah spoke about in Lamentations and what we're talking about here in our own community. Because listen, this is a community that's been afflicted over the past month, is it not? When Ingalil and I left for our trip to spend the holidays with family in Sweden and in England, when we left, Santa Barbara was on fire. And when we came back on Tuesday, we couldn't get to the city because of the floods. We had to fly in instead of driving. I mean, between the fire and floods and mud and death and evacuations and destruction and all the rest of it, People wonder what's going on. Now, let me be very clear with this. With Jerusalem in Jeremiah's day, it had been announced for at least a hundred years before the fall of Jerusalem, this is the judgment of God. And it was announced by God's legitimate, authoritative prophets. Not the phony baloney kind, but, but true prophets of God announced that his judgment was coming. He warned about his judgment upon Jerusalem again and again. This hasn't happened with what's happened in Montecito. Listen, we all want to do that, don't we? I mean, natural disaster happens somewhere. It's a judgment of God. Tornadoes in Iowa, huh, it's a judgment of God. Hurricanes on the East Coast, that's a judgment of God. When it comes to your own community, they're like, well, wait a minute. And I know what some people are thinking. What's all those movie stars in Montecito? It's a judgment of God. Listen, brother, sister, have a clear mind about this. This is not like the fall of Jerusalem where God pronounced for at least 100 years before that his judgment was coming. 
This is more like what Jesus spoke about in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verse 4, where he talked about the fall of the Tower of Siloam. And he said, do you think that those people who were killed in what we might call the natural disaster of the fall of the Tower of Siloam, do you think that they were worse sinners than anybody else? And he said they weren't worse sinners than anybody else. It's not like a natural disaster is necessarily an expression of God's judgment. We don't want to be those people who are so quick to say, oh, it's a judgment of God. It's a judgment of God. Now, we also don't want to be those people who act as if it's impossible for God to express his judgment in some time or place. But I think we can all agree on this, and this is the point that Jesus made in Luke chapter 13 with his story about the Tower of Siloam. Jesus made the point. He said, listen, you need to wake up. I'm paraphrasing Jesus' thought there, of course, in Luke chapter 13, uh, verses 4 and 5. You need to wake up and make sure that you're right with God. Friends, I, I, I can't say, and I certainly would not say, that what happened in our area, in our community over the last month is a judgment of God, but I will say it's a wake-up call for each individual person, isn't it? It's a wake-up call for us to see that the abundance of our life does not consist in what we possess. It's a wake-up call for us to see that the important things really are what God does in and through us as a community. It's a wake-up call for us to love one another and to look out after one another and to realize that there's a message of new life in Jesus Christ that we have a responsibility to get out to a needy world. This is the wake-up call that God gives us through events such as this. So when we read the agonized grief of the man in the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah the prophet, we, we don't automatically transfer the same principle. It's a different thing with Jerusalem in his day, but we learn from it. And we learn from it from a man who feels like God is pushing him away in the midst of his grief and well, he continues on. Look at verse 10. He has been to me a bear lying in wait, like a lion in ambush. He's turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He's made me desolate. He's bent his bow. He's set me up as a target for the arrow. He's caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I've become the ridicule of all my people. Their taunting song all the day. He's filled me with bitterness. He's made me drink wormwood. He's also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You've moved my soul far from peace. I've forgotten prosperity. And I've said my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Now, in this beautiful but dark poetic eloquence, Jeremiah described all the ways that he felt God was coming against him. God was like, in verse 10, the bear and the lion waiting for a surprise attack. God was, in verse 12, like the archer who bent his bow and was using him as target practice. God was the mocker, in verse 14, with a taunting song against his people. In verse 15, God's the judge giving a cup of judgment, wormwood for the condemned to drink. In verse 16, God is the brute breaking teeth with gravel. We look at all of this, and this is such an eloquent, it's beautiful in its darkness, expressing the grief. God, where are you in the midst of this? And in his agonized cry, he comes to verse 18. And look closely with verse 18 with me. He says, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Now that sounds like a very dark statement, doesn't it? My strength has perished from the Lord. My hope has perished from the Lord. It sounds so dark, but I want you to notice there is the flicker of light in verse 18 that's going to expand to a torchlight in the following verses. And do you know what the flicker of light is in verse 18? It's the name of God. When you look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 1 through 18, you will find repeated reference. I counted, I think it's 18 or 20. Repeated reference to God as a distant third person. He, his. Just look at those verses. He, his. Over and over again. 
Finally, at verse 18, he mentions for the first time the name of God. Yahweh, the Lord, the covenant God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God, may I say, perfectly revealed to us in Jesus Christ. He mentions him by name. It's no longer he, it's no longer his. In verse 18, even though it's a dark saying, he's calling on the name of the Lord. My strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. And it's as if that bare mention of the name of God, more than just he or him, that provides a flicker of light. That as I said, you just wait, it's going to turn into a torchlight in just a few moments. There's a huge lesson for us, friends. When God was distant to Jeremiah, just to he, just to him, there wasn't much hope in that. He kept spiraling down in a cascading waterfall of destruction and despair. But as soon as he named the name of God, as soon as it was Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, and not just a distant he or him, that's when things begin to change. Can I apply this for you? In your time of despair and crisis, the man upstairs isn't enough. Uh, A higher power isn't enough. Some vague God who's out there, but you don't know, that's not enough. You need the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. You need the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You need the one revealed to us in truth. And as long as it was distant, as long as it was third person, he, his, him, nothing got better. But now, even if it's in a dark way, he mentions the Lord, Yahweh, the light begins to turn on. Look at verse 19 and 20. Remember my affliction and roaming, The wormwood and the gall, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. Jeremiah wasn't looking to positive thinking as the cure for his deep affliction. He actually felt it was useful to remember it. And he called upon God to remember it, to understand it for what it was. He wasn't trying to pretend that it wasn't there. And then he says in verse 20, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. It was good For Jeremiah's soul to sink low enough to where it could find its footing on the rock and sink no deeper. And that's exactly where he rests. Because he's transitioned from complaint to humility. Now he's calling out to God. I'm low before you, God. Now, brothers and sisters, let me be very honest with you. There is a place for calling out your complaint before God. Every life has its own suffering. And we're not here in some kind of bizarre contest to compare suffering. Isn't that weird how we sometimes mentally do that? Oh, but well, uh, they lost their car. That's pretty bad. Oh, but then they lost their house. Oh, oh, but then then this dear relative was lost to them. Oh, well, then this spouse was lost. Well, then this child was lost. And we have a way of trying to compare people's suffering and make that kind of equation. I just want you to clear all of that out of your mind and just understand that each individual life has its own pain, has its own suffering. But if they will receive it, it also has its own comfort from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the midst of all of this, Jeremiah is remembering. And and as I said before, he's transitioned from complaint to humility. There is a place in your own individual pain for calling out your complaint against God. And the Bible gives many such examples of this. But it isn't the place to live. If these first 20 verses of Lamentations chapter 3 resonate with your heart and say, that's where I'm at. Well, good. Those verses are in the Bible there for you to say that God hears your grief. He recognizes it. He'll latch on to it. He, he, He understands it maybe even more eloquently than you understand it. But there has to be that place, that transition from complaint to humility before God. 
Because God is God, and he governs this universe and knows what he's doing. And that transition from complaint to humility leads us to verse 21. Are you ready for the light to explode forth in a dawn of a new day? Because here it is in verse 21. This I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Isn't that beautiful? You you see, he transitioned from God being vaguely out there to a person, the Lord, upon whom he called. He transitioned from complaint to humility and now His eyes are open to see the goodness and the power of God. Verse 21, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. For perhaps the first time in the whole book of Lamentations, hope is allowed. He sunk low in his soul, but now he remembers something that starts hope within him. And he says this, it's his triumphant declaration. Look at verse 20 through. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Now, I know somebody may think this is faulty logic, but there's real logic. Jeremiah looked over the devastation of Jerusalem and he said, it could have been worse. Look look at how God's evidence of preservation was seen here and here and here and here. And friends, there is definitely a place for that kind of thinking. As bad as the devastation is, there was an example of God's mercy and goodness in that things were not completely consumed. Wherever God leaves life, he leaves hope. And he does it through his mercies. Through the Lord's mercies were not consumed. That word mercies, I gotta control myself right now because it's one of the great words of the Old Testament. I wanna go off on a preaching tangent on that great word. It's the great Hebrew word chesed. And it means God's covenant love, his loyal love, his uh, long-standing mercy, his great mercy towards his people. And it's one of the most triumphant words in the entire Old Testament vocabulary in the ancient Hebrew. This chesed from the Lord is God's word to his people that I'm going to stick by you that I've made a covenant with you, that I'll never forsake you. It's his loyal love. It's the great compassion that pours forth from God. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Look at the next line in verse 22. Because his compassions fail not. Even in the severity of the destruction that Jeremiah saw in the Jerusalem of his day, he realized that there was evidence of his compassions. Brothers and sisters, we see it all over Montecito right there, right now. Were not his compassions seen in the many rescues? Were not his compassions seen in the bravery of the first responders? Were not his compassions seen in the love and the support of God's people? That's why one of the things I'm so excited about, the open doors that God has given us as a congregation to to, to really go forth and show forth the love of Jesus right there in Montecito. We are in evidence that his compassions fail not. God bless Pastor Tommy and the leadership of our church for, for not just seeing that open door, but walking through it and saying, let's make the most of it as possible. We are gonna go forth and be a living evidence. God's compassions fail not. Just look at us right here. And then you can see that his compassions fail not in the response of the community to rally around and to rebuild. His compassions are seen even in the simplest of signs. Listen, Ingalil and I, we were coming back from Europe last Tuesday when all of this hit. So I didn't see this personally, but I saw it from lots of posts online, Facebook and the such. That even in the midst of all of it, God painted some beautiful rainbows in the sky just to testify of his presence and of that truth that his compassions fail not. We can take confidence in that. Matter of fact, not only do they not fail, look at verse 23. 
They are new every morning. Every dawning day gives us hope and fresh mercies and compassions from God. I don't know about you. I need new mercies and compassions every morning from God. Don't you? Sometimes I worry if I wore them all out the day before. But God says, no, here's new mercies for a new day. No matter how bad the previous day was, God's people can look to the morning with faith and hope. And they're always new because they come from God. You know, our treasures that we have, they often become like stagnant pools. But God's mercies are like ever-flowing streams. Now, if you ever follow an ever-flowing stream, you know, take a walk along, sometimes you'll lose sight of it. You have to go around a bend or over a hill, and you lose sight of the stream, but it's always there. And God's mercies are just like that. Like an ever-flowing stream, they're always there, even if we lose sight of them for the moment. And his mercies are truly new every morning. Every morning ends the night. Every morning brings a new day. Every morning brings new provision for the day. Every morning brings new forgiveness for sins. Every morning brings new strength for the temptations and the challenges you're going to face that particular day. And so when Jeremiah thinks about all of that, what does he say? He says what you and I would say. Look at verse 23 with me. Great is your faithfulness. You never fail in sending your mercies and compassions. Even in their catastrophe, God was faithful. And we trust in the faithfulness of our great God. We sang that together this morning, didn't we? Great is your faithfulness because it's true. Now, we end with just a look at verses 24, 25, and 26. These describe God's goodness to the seeking soul. Look at the peace Jeremiah comes to, starting at verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We need to come to the place where we can say with satisfaction and triumph, just like Jeremiah said, the Lord is my portion. Do you understand what that means? You ever ordered at a restaurant and get a portion of food and you're immediately dissatisfied with it? It's too small. You wish you would have ordered what they had. But whatever's before you, like, man, I didn't want this. That's not being happy with your portion. Here's the lesson. When the Lord is your portion, your soul will be at peace. And sometimes what a catastrophe, what a disaster like this does is it clears away the things that maybe before we made that our portion, a a certain standing, a certain house, a certain place in our heart, a certain sense of security that everything's great. Maybe those things were our portion and we come back, no, no. Those things have no real security. The Lord is my portion. And the Lord will never forsake us. Oh, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy and good. It doesn't mean that we'll be rescued from every calamity, but God will never forsake us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And that's our peace. That's our rest in the midst of it. God faithfully ministered to the people after the fall and the devastation of Jerusalem. He does it here in our own day as well. Jeremiah had that satisfied soul with it. And I can tell you here that we have much greater reason for satisfaction of soul than even Jeremiah had. Because we have the revelation of Jesus Messiah. We know so much more about the person and work of God than even Jeremiah did. So we should be able to say it even more confidently. Verse 24, therefore I hope in him. Jesus, you are my portion. You're the one who rescued me from sin and shame. You're the one who rescued me from my dishonor, from my weakness, from my vulnerability to a hostile world around me. You are my rescuer, Jesus, because of what you did on the cross. 
Because you came and identified with sinful, weak people like us, we find our refuge in you. Therefore, verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks in him. And now verse 26, it is good that he should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You know, if something's good, it's worth waiting for. I can tell you that it's worth waiting for God and his work. If you or people near you are stressed, agonized, devastated about what's happened in the last month, this message is not all about get over it, God is good. This message is about put your hope in the Lord and wait on him. He will come to you. He will meet your need in the very deepest place of your heart. This is God's faithful assurance to us. The God who revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ can do no less. He's worth waiting for and hoping for. We're going to conclude with song of worship. As we do, we're going to have a prayer team up front. Of course, it would be no surprise if there's a particular heart cry for prayer this morning. Burdens that either you have or you have on behalf of other people. I don't want to act like the only people qualified to pray for you and your need are those who are up here up front because there's people all around you who would love to pray for you and serve you in your time of need. But these people up front here are especially here for you. I often think about about what a shame it would be if there was even a single unmet need that left this room. Because God's people and God's heart are here to meet that. So I'm going to pray. We're going to continue in worship and we're going to have a prayer team up front here ready and willing to minister unto you. Father in heaven, thank you that your faithfulness is great. Thank you that your compassions fail not. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, we say all that not to erase the devastation, but to remember your greatness and goodness in the light of it. And Father, we pray for a particular strength and even anointing to this congregation, to Pastor Tommy, to the other pastors, to our elders, Lord, to really take advantage of every opportunity we have to show the never-failing compassion, the always-new mercy of our God. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord. We need you to love people through us. Help us to do it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a message from the ministry of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. For more information about our church, please visit calvarysb.com.